Hello everyone, uh, I'm Chong Ma. I have been working on the Sturgeon Lake transact in the last uh, three years. Now the field work of the, of the Sturgeon transect is uh, basically done. So I'm uh, working on the second project about the western extension uh, of the Ladder Lake um, Porcupine Duster deformation zones. So last summer, we started this uh, project uh, from the Wawa area. So today I'm gonna show you some uh, preliminary results from last summer's work about uh, uh, structures and kinematics of uh, uh, the gold bearing shear zone system in the Michipicotan greenstone belt, specifically in the uh, Jubilee stock area for those of uh, familiar with the area. So first, uh, very special th thanks to uh, Red Pine Exploration. This work was done within uh, their property. So uh, great helpful, uh, great uh, help from their uh, support. So uh, the ultimate goal for this project was uh, to investigate the major deformation zones uh, to the west of the Ladder Lake and Cadillac and the porcupine duster deformation zones to evaluate their uh, relationships to the gold deposits within or adjacent to the deformation zones. Hopefully uh, we could understand better about the potential of the West extension of the, the, these two major deformation zones in the future. So we started this work last summer from the Michipicotan greenstone belt here. Let me switch on my laser point. So that's uh, the, the location of the Michipicotan greenstone belt here. Then there are some uh, smaller greenstone belts nearby. Overall, this area is defined as uh, the Wawa Gold Camp. So the regional geology can be summarized as uh, three episodes of uh, bimodal volcanism and uh, some volcanic plutonism at uh, 2.9 billion years, 2.75 uh, and 2.7 billion years, including multiple air formations in black uh, of this uh, uh, schematic uh, crust column. So this whole package was, uh, uh, was followed by the deposition of a sedimentary sequence, which is uh, the door conglomerate. Structurally, the available data so far support a regional recumbent syncline. If you look at this uh, simple sketch here, uh, a regional uh, recumbent syncline with uh, the youngest uh, sedimentary rocks in the core, which was then overprinted by upright folding and imbricate thrusting. So the Regional deformation continued until 2671 million years ago when the uh, post tectonic plutons were in place. So last summer we focused on the Jubilee stock area in the box here uh, within the Red Pine property. So this study area features multiple uh, northeast and northwest striking fault zones hosting organic gold. And uh, they range from ductile to ductile brittle transition to brittle deformation. And uh, including strike slip, oblique, and deep slip deformation, and both compressional and extensional faulting. So it's very interesting, very complicated. And both SL and IO tectonics. So for those who are not familiar with IL and SL tectonics, so SL tectonics means we have both planar and linear fabrics in the rocks, whereas IL tectonic means there is only linear fabrics preserved in the rocks. So a gradual study uh, investigated uh, the gold mineralization in the shear zones, which found that the native gold was generated during two major events. The first one, uh, the first generation was the same deformation gold um, in arsenopyrite and pyrite associated with the formation of schist and melanite. Here, this picture shows a schist of, uh, that was formed during the D1 to D2 deformation event. 
Then the first, uh, the second generation of uh, uh, gold mineralization was uh, uh, was about post deformation. Was post deformation, and uh, they uh, are closely associated with the BIT minerals called pyrite and pyrite in quartz veins, possibly associated with the, the one billion year lamprey decks in the area. So very important. Uh, Note was that almost uh, all the gold in the Jubilee stock area was uh, originated from the solid solution gold in D1 acinoparat. So, with this information, uh, we investigated the major deformation zones. It's, uh, most of them are shear zones in the area, and which are shown in red on this image. So now I'm going to present the structural features of each uh, fault zone. So the first one is the Greece shear zone right here, which is northwest, southeast oriented. It's probably one of the oldest uh, in this area. So here we are looking at uh, some, some maps. The top panel here, including the map and figure, represent data from a horizontal surface. So basically we are looking downward as a bird. Then the panel at lower part is a cross section uh, from a vertical explorer. Okay, so we, let's look at the horizontal explorer. From left to right, we have those spaced shear zones. Then transitions to pervasive uh, ductile deformation that has uh, very well developed C as SCC prior fabrics that indicate a dextro shear, or excuse me, sinister shear. Then on the cross section from left to right, from left to right, we can still see the uh, spaced shear zone, uh, in, especially in upper part of this outcrop. Then in the lower part, we have a beautifully developed uh, IOTEC tonnet. Then of course, to the right, we have the major fall zone here. Uh, even on vertical surface, we see some beautiful SCC prior fabrics indicating vertical motion. Here is a picture of the l tonnet. As you can see, the strong linear fabrics uh, on the horizontal surface, but on the vertical surface, there is no preferred orientation of any mineral or uh, mineral aggregates. Here is just another beautiful explorer to convince you the development of SCC pre structures, basically indicating sinister deformation. Here is uh, uh, the summary of the structural data, and the, uh, the mean C plan and the mean C pre plan uh, that, uh, that are oriented northwest, southeast oriented. So basically, the structure data tells us uh, that the fault zone is uh, northwest southeast striking with a sinister strike slip faulting. And uh, data from the vertical explorer tells us uh, the northeast side up, the southwest side down. So there was uh, some shortening along uh, northeast southwest direction that is orthogonal to the shear zone. So the deviation is horizontal to oblique. Then there was a local constrictional strain as shown by the IOTEC tonnet. I just want to highlight uh, uh, the strike slip shear along northwest south orientation uh, direction. Then that was combined with orthogonal shortening simultaneously, at least locally. So that's the feature of this uh, deformation zone. Then the thin sections show that the formation of melanite, arch melanite, was followed by growth of new carbonate and biotite. Then let's move to the Jubilee shear zone in the southern part right here. Then there's another Jubilee shear zone in the northern part here that uh, will be shown later. So here we are looking at a map. This is not a cross section. See the most strong fabrics are concentrated to the uh, southeast corner of this uh, trench. Uh, the lineation is thus plunging here, and uh, it's uh, oblique to the foliation with moderate plunge. And the kinematics, basically uh, asymmetric uh, structures and ductile lineations tells us top to north oblique thrusting. 
there's another trench next to it, uh, Jew Beach South 2 trench, similar, but uh, with a uh, much more, um, much better uh, L tectonic and S tectonic. As you can see, this zone is L tectonic, then there's some combination of S L tectonic, so similar structures. Again, uh, the major takeaway message from this outcrop is top to north oblique thrusting with local constrictional strain. Then the thin section tells us significant grain size reduction of quartz and plagioclase was overprinted by quartz carbonate alteration. So here we are looking at uh, a major uh, trench in the Jubilee North Jubilee shares only in the northern part. Here we are looking at a very long trench map from northwest at upper left corner, then uh, south, uh, southeast of the trench in lower right corner. Uh, I'm going to present uh, three major uh, structures along this trench. We're going to start from this part. That is a Jubilee shear zone. As you can see, the Jubilee shear zone is uh, about 30 meters. Uh, at this location, and uh, the structure are changing from northwest to southeast. Basically, we have top northeast uh, sinister shear in the north, in this part. Then gradually moving to uh, the southeast direction, we have top to north northwest thrusting, and then top to north oblique thrusting, similar to the uh, structured data from the Juby shear zone in the southern part of the property. See, uh, this picture shows a beautiful. L tectonite in tonalite. Again, top to north oblique thrusting with local cons constrictional strain. Then uh, the thin sections show syn deformation growth of quartz, carbonate, wet mica, and tourmaline along the foliation. And moving to the northwest part of the trench, we have a beautiful exposure of extrusion. So uh, in the lower, in the upper part of uh, the outcrop, we have uh, a top to south motion, whereas in the lower part, we have top to north motion. So basically, it tells us it's uh, extruding to the north-northwest direction, which is a parallel to the Jubilee shear zone L tectonite. Then at the northwest corner of this trench, we have uh, uh, exposures of the Horblen shear zone. In this shear zone, we documented uh, uh, multiple phases of deformation. The earliest one was uh, the major fabrics. Uh, uh, they, tell, they tell us top to northeast oblique extension um, or sinister to normal sinister shear. Then that was followed by top to southeast uh, extension along about 110 degrees, reactivating the earlier foliation and quartz vent. Uh, with quartz vein growth. And last generation was the formation of the tourmaline quartz vein that's uh, cross-cutting the fabrics from the earlier two generations. So uh, very strong ductile shear followed by a brittle, ductile brittle transitional uh, extension. The takeaway message from this exposure is to is a top to northeast oblique extension overprinted by top to southeast east extension. Then the thin sections show that uh, Clara defined the foliation with the thin deformation quartz vein uh, for the main fabric. Now we are moving to another fall zone right here. Uh, it's called the mental B shear zone. Here we are looking at uh, the map in the, in the upper panel, then the cross-section uh, in the lower panel with some uh, representative uh, photos. So on the map, we can see the fabrics are concentrated within the schist, belt schist, and the contact between the schist and, uh, uh, and the gabbro here. There are some massive tonalite within the schist and uh, uh, some lamprophy deck cross cutting it. So, overall, the uh, foliation is sub vertical, which is uh, very different from uh, uh, the, the Jubilee shear zone and the Hoblin shear zone, which are uh, moderately to shallowly plunging up 
deep into the east and the southeast. So here we are looking at a subvertical foliation and subvertical subvertical lineation, ductile lineation, with some subhorizontal granulation lineation. And uh, the granulation lineation is uh, they are pl plotted subhorizontally sub on the uh, sterile net, as you can see by the small dots here. The kinematics on the vertical surface, for example, this picture here of IC fabrics and uh, this uh, uh, shared belt tunnelite here, uh, they are all consistent with uh, vertical motion. Basically, uh, northwest side up and southeast side down. So that means shortening along northwest southeast direction. So the thin sections show that uh, the carbonate, quartz, and chlorate are arranged as IC structure, which indicates thin deformation alteration. Then we are moving to this little explorer of, of Cooper shear zone. This is a very interesting ex explorer because uh, we can see the cross-cutting relationship between two shear zones. Uh, the horizontal one is the Cooper fault, the so Cooper fault zone or Cooper shear zone. Uh, then another one cross-cutting, cross-cut by the Cooper fault zone is the mental B fault zone here in blue. And the lineation is a deep slip, as you can see from this uh, data set here. And on the cross section, we can see the asymmetric structures of uh, uh, the quartz vein, synchromatic quartz vein, telling us uh, top to northeast extension. Here is uh, an example of the reaching groove ductile lineation uh, on the far surface of the Cooper shear zone or Cooper fall zone. And that's the uh, example of the IC fabrics. So this one just tells us top to northeast extension. The thin sections show thin deformation covenant, chlorate, sericet, quartz alteration. So continue moving to the next fall zone, which is Park Hill number four fall zone at this location. Here we are looking at a cross section. And uh, as you can see, the hanging wall is tonalite. The fall zone is defined by beltite schist. The foot wall is uh, beltite tonalite again. So the strain was concentrated within the beltite schist, which is uh, understandable. It's easy to be deformed. So the beautiful typical IC fabrics in the fall zone here indicates top to northeast or top to north. Uh, extension. So there could be some deep slip to oblique uh, extension. All right, so next, oh, before that, uh, thin sections show some deformation chloride quartz alteration. So the next one is a, is a Park Hill fault, which is different from the Park Hill number four fault of the previous slide. So this one is brittle. Okay, so we are looking at a map. This is not a cross section. We are looking at as a bird looking down. Okay, so to the left, we have a belt schist with some quartz vein. To the right, it's, it's tonalite. So uh, the fall zone is just a couple centimeters long. As, as you can see, the slick line here, um, pretty steep to vertical. Then the uh, slick fiber growth with some uh, uh, northeast block uh, steps facing down. So the steps and the lineation tells us the subvertical brittle faulting with uh, southwest down and uh, northeast up. So here is a summary of uh, the structure data from this property. And uh, we can see the gray shear zone that's mostly sinister strikes lead faulting with some uh, uh, orthogonal shortening, which is probably cross-cut by the jubilee shear zone that is mostly uh, top to north oblique thrusting, including both sinister strike slip faulting and orthogonal shortening across it, which is similar to the northern part of the Jubilee shear zone. Then the Hoblin shear zone is oriented uh, sub parallel to the Jubilee shear zone, but it's got uh, an extensional component 
perpendicular to this uh, fault zone. But uh, the uh, deformation parallel to the fault zone, it's, it's consistent uh, kinematic with the Jubilee shear zone. Both are sinister shear. Then the mental B shear zone is uh, mostly shortening along um, northwest of east orientation. And uh, uh, it is cut, cross cut by the Cooper fault zone that is roughly perpendicular uh, to the mental B shear zone. Then there's another extensional fault zone, uh, brittle, at least uh, brittle ductile transitional to ductile, parkhill number four fault zone, um, top to northeast extension with some oblique motion along the fault zone. And finally, this dashed line, that's the brittle fault, indicating vertical motion of the crust. So my preliminary interpretation of the structures, I, I would say gris shear zone here, a represents D1 deformation, that's uh, range dominated transpression along northwest southeast fault zone. So again, this is a map view. Then for interpretation of D2, I think uh, based on the kinematics and uh, the, the fabrics in the rocks and fence sections, the deformation of uh, Jubilee shear zone in the south and north and the Horbland shear zone and the Mental B shear zone, plus the extrusion uh, structures I documented between the Horbland and the Jubilee shear zones, they are consistent with, uh, uh, with a systematic folding deformation, uh, which is illustrated here along this uh, orientation. From northwest to southeast, we can interpret the Horbley shear zone, Jubilee shear zone, and those uh, two ductile deformation horizons between as uh, a folded shear zone system. The red arrows, those are data, those are kinematic data collected from the field. So, the kinematic data are consistent with this interpretation. If you put mental B shear zone somewhere here to the east subvertical, it, it's consistent as well. So potentially this can tell us the, the virgins of folding in, for the regional deformation. Overall, we think this is, I think at least, Northwest, southeast shortening plus local vertical shortening so that uh, we can produce the L tectonic and extrusion that's constrictional deformation. Then D3 is about northeast, southwest extension um, represented by the Cooper fault zone and the Park Hill number four fault zone. And lastly, uh, the brittle deformation along the Park Hill fault here. Uh, which demonstrates vertical motion across northwest of east striking subvertical fault with uh, uh, northeast side up. So this, so across this dash line, this side up toward us, and the other side uh, going uh, inward into the screen. So that's my summary of the generations of deformation within uh, the Jubilee stock area. With that, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chong. Um, I have a question. So yeah. Th this, this project was really to trace the duster porcupine and the Cadillac across the Capus casing and into the Wawa. Uh, do you think you've, do you think this, deformation system you're describing here is part of that or how do you think that relates in a regional context? And unfortunately I, at this point I think this is not consistent with the deformation of the porcupine cardiac deformation zone. So because the approach to, to this project basically was to study the deformation at a given location and its relationship with the regional geology and the, the gold mineralization, then compare what have been gathered to those known from the uh, cut, Lotter Lake, Cadillac, and the Porcupine deformation zones. So based on the 
current data from this area, I don't think this part, at least this part of the, at least the Jubilee stock area is, is not part of the West extension of the two deformation zones, unfortunately. So how, how are you gonna test your, uh, your, your, your main project? Well, I need to move to the new, pro new areas uh, to study some other deformation zones uh, in the northern part of the Mississippi coating greenstone belt. Then to the Swazi area uh, to study the red out deformation zone and the potentially the, the Rondo deformation zone as well to the north. Okay, very good. We have uh, time for another question. David. Hi, John, very interesting. Uh, and, and sort of again, as a follow up to what Russ, Ross was just asking you, uh, it seems to not being very expert in the these exact area, but you're not too geographically distant from the campus casing structures. And it seems kinematically there are some similarities to me. I, I was wondering if you had looked at any of the literature about the Kappus casing structure and, and tried to do a comparison. I realize the ages might be assumed to be quite different, but could there be some older kinematics associated with uh, and strains associated with the Kappus casing that relate to what you're looking at here? It's possible. I haven't got uh, a chance to look at the literature from uh, the Kappus casing deformation zone. Uh, with my limited understanding, it seems uh, people are considering the Kappus casing as uh, the mid to lower crust of equivalent to the Mississippi coating. So there could be some uh, connections, uh, let's say schematically, horizontally, uh, vertically from a shallow crust to deeper crust. Uh, I don't know at this time, but uh, I will try to dig in a little bit more about uh, this potential connection. Thank you, David. Time for one more, if anybody's got a, a quick question. Hey, uh, John here, uh, Chung. Um, you talk about the lake gold being rated to Lamperfear, and you said that uh, was, uh, I think, a 1.1 billion uh, Lamperfear, but there are many Archean Lamperfears there. So how would you say that this one is, uh, is a younger Lamperfear? Well, I have uh, no data to support that. That was basically uh, one of the conclusions from uh, uh, the master thesis uh, that was conducted uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, yeah, there are another Lamperfield deck emplacement event. I believe that was 2.5 many years. So most of the Lamperfears are around maybe 2.7, 2.9-ish. And many of them are diamond bearing. So um, I, I just thought it might be interesting to know if it might be related to the late Archean uh, Lamperfear suite in the Wawa area. Okay, so the many of the Lamperfear decks in the property, they are not deformed at all. That's uh, what I saw last year. But uh, I'll pay attention to the other uh, generations to see if there's any connection. Uh, I'm gonna do another Where, week, few work. The uh, Lampra fears don't appear to be affected at all by the faulting or the, or the strain? They cross-cut all the deformation. Mm. Well, yeah. that's an interesting feature, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ian, if, if it's quick. Uh, hey Chong, uh, how does the uh, how does this interpretation relate to, or is it? I guess is it consistent with the uh, the Heather and Arius uh, structural interpretation for uh, the belt? Well, their interpretation, I mean, at original scale, is largely north south compression or shortening. Uh, here, I'm looking at a smaller scale that's telling me northwest southeast orientation shortening, but also I have evidence of north south shortening. So uh, I don't think I don't see a big contrast here. They all can be they all could be consistent kinematically, considering the different scale. We can talk more about this later. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks very much, John.